I'm really excited to be with you uh, via video um, this morning, and I apologize that I'm not there in person, but you are all going to enjoy so much Mr. Michael Cox and Mr. Jonathan Guthrie as they share with you the application of educational neuroscience as it relates to trauma and adversity in brain development. And in fact, where I am is Vancouver, and we are, they were very interested at the University of British Columbia in seeing what schools and districts around the state of Indiana are doing with regard to implementing this new framework that you will hear about this morning into um, our high schools and middle schools and elementary schools. So in this brief overview, which Michael and John will expound upon, I want to share with you um, a new lens to look through these behaviors that we are seeing that can look very disrespectful, they can look oppositional and defiant, um, oftentimes they look shut down, apathetic, but what we are beginning to learn deeply, and we need to know this in education, is that our experiences, what we bring into the world, actually create circuits in the brain that become hardwired, just like habits we have. Um, those hardwired circuits are certain behaviors or reactions or thoughts or um, perpetual feelings, um, the way we think, the way we do life. And so this morning, what I would love to share with you that I'm learning every day is that not only do experiences build brain architecture, but the adversities inside of those experiences that many of our children and adolescents walk into schools with can magnify, distort, and compromise brain development, also reprogramming our stress response systems. I wish that I had known this research when I was teaching. Um, I wish that I had known this when my own children were younger. Because what we are learning today is that when we look at the application of educational neuroscience and brain development, this is more about your brain state than it is even the students you sit beside. We know that emotions are contagious. We understand that we also get triggered. And when we have worked hard, when we have been developing curriculum, when we have been sitting beside a student with regard to behaviors, when we have been making accommodations, it feels awful when we feel um, disrespected or when we feel um, you know, attacked or violated. So what we know today is that our children and adolescents who from birth through age 18, who have experienced significant adversities, such as going, living in an environment where there was a divorce or separation, growing up in poverty, domestic violence, significant neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse, having someone that you love incarcerated, um, feeling or perceiving social rejection and humiliation throughout a lifetime, a young lifetime. We also know that um, growing up with um, chronic illnesses or having an accident, um, a series of accidents at a young age um, affect the way um, our stress response systems and the brain develops. So we are seeing in this time a new learning disability across our nation. And that learning disability is anxiety. And we are seeing an increase in children K through 12, pre-K through 12, walking into our schools and classrooms dysregulated and rough. And so this year, we are taking these brain aligned strategies and we are implementing them inside of our procedures, inside of our routines, inside of our transitions. We're not asking, this is not a program, this is a framework for how we sit beside our children and adolescents in helping them to co-regulate and in attachment. So th because this is not a program, um, there's nothing to purchase, and we know that people change people, not programs. So it's strengthening your relationship with students, with your colleagues, 
and it's co-regulating, meaning being with a student as they calm the, their nervous system. It's not negating punishment. It's not negating discipline. But what we now understand is that traditional discipline works the best with the students who need it the least. So when we talk about our brain states, behavior management as an administrator is not about uh, my students. It is about my brain state. It is about how I'm regulated when I approach one of my colleagues or a student or a teacher that I sit beside. As an administrator, your classroom is your staff. And I am, I, just over the past couple of weeks, it just becomes clearer and clearer to me that when you are implementing these with your staff, all of the strategies John and Michael will be sharing with you, these what we call touch points, when you're implementing these with your staff, you're actually modeling the behaviors that you want those students and those teachers to interface with. So as John and Michael talk with you about significant strategies such as 2 by 10, you'll hear more about that, or ways to regulate and calm through focused attention practices, um, brain intervals, all of these are built into what we already do. And that's the beauty of this is that they become a part of our practice. Whether I'm an administrator and I'm conducting a staff meeting or I'm sitting with a group of um, educators in, in a department chair meeting, we model these behaviors. So in finishing up this introduction, I also want to share with you that these behavioral challenges that we are seeing are regulation challenges, which are physiological challenges. This is a child, an adolescent, that has never had an adult never had a caregiver to sit beside them and to co-regulate everything that's coming in through the environment. We know that children and adolescents spend 13,000 hours in school between the ages of kindergarten and grade 12 on average. And we also understand, right, wrong, good or bad, that our schools are the de facto where we can come together and create a community, hopefully, including everyone who sits beside our children and adolescents. This is a new time, it's a rough time. We know we have a mental health crisis, but we also know that the brain is built for resiliency. The brain is built to bend and not to break. And the resiliency is very, very clear that even when a child returns to a very toxic environment, if they have one healthy connection one healthy attachment with an adult who they perceive as safe, who they trust, those relationships, those attachments trump the adversity that this child or adolescent is experiencing. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you so much, and I will hopefully see everybody soon.